Kate, you and I have had many conversations about post-colonial healing, and I have really appreciated what you've um, shared about what it was like growing up in Alaska, and I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about that. Um, yeah, actually, I should start with the fact that I haven't lived in Alaska for 30 years, but it's um, that was generated, the moving out of Alaska was generated, I think, because of a history that I had a hard time understanding, and it's only been recently that I began to recognize the time period that I grew up in and the impact that it had on me. Um, I grew up in the 50s and um, 60s and 70s in Alaska. I was born and raised there, and when I went to school, well, first when I was born there, we were territory. We weren't yet a state, so I didn't ever really feel part of the continental United States. Um, the announcements about our weather forecasts were afterthoughts on the television news, so it was as if we didn't quite belong, and we didn't at the time. Um, and when I went to school, it was at a time when the state was just beginning to be developed. Roads mm. and bridges and schools were being built and hospitals were being built. And my father was there um, because of construction, so he was very much part of building that infrastructure for the state. It was a time when um, still the kids in the villages were not educated in their villages, and so they were shipped into places like Mount Edgecombe in southeastern Alaska and into Fairbanks to live with host families so that they could go to the school system. So they were always taken away from their families. They weren't allowed to speak their own language. And it, you could really feel the influx of the Western um, culture, the Western value system, the Western economic system moving, moving, moving into Alaska. and. I very much felt like I belonged to Alaska. I was born there. I felt the um, power and the immensity of this land, but I also felt very guilty being there. Mm -hmm. I felt like we were, I didn't have a name for it when I was a kid, but I felt like we were colonialists, and I could feel the um, anger and the resentment of the kids from the villages when they came in mm -hmm. um, because they weren't with their family. Uh -huh. And the kids you're talking about from the villages, um, it sounds like you're talking about the children who were indigenous. Yes, they Alaska. were yeah. either um, Athabascan uh -huh. or they were Yupit mm -hmm. or they were Nupiat from mm -hmm. the north. Um, and they were required to leave their villages and come to a place where there was a school. It wasn't really until somewhere in the 70s or early 80s, I think, when they passed the Molly Hooch case, which required that if there were six kids in the village, they had to actually build a school mm -hmm. in the village. But up until that time, they had to come into the cities. And they were away from their families for months on end. Um, and there was an attitude in the cities, which were primarily white, said that um, the native kids were second-class citizens. So that, combined with laws and regulations that gave them a different experience than the white kids had, there, there was a really distinct feeling of a colonial uh -huh. system. Uh -huh. And it took its toll. I yeah. felt it. I wasn't in my parents' position where there was some, they could overcome it in a way because they were there to just survive and right. make a living. Right. I just absorbed yep. this feeling. So we've talked about how children, you're speaking about how it was as a child, right? absorbing this that energy that was there. So um, we've talked about how children absorb you know, whatever is there, no matter what the context is, you mm -hmm. know, that they're living in. And so um, I'm wondering if we could talk a little bit about what your recent experience there in Alaska, being recently colonized, it's not something that we typically think of. And right. the, we don't think of Alaska being recently colonized. So could you say a little bit about, you know, what you think about what there might be available to us in the lower 48 
um, from a teaching perspective about the impact of that and then the relevance of it for our larger you know history as a country that we've all got this inheritance um, yeah what I noticed um, I when my daughter was going to school in mm -hmm. California I read her history books with her and it uh -huh. teaches about the history of colonialism um, she was in the fifth grade when a lot of the civil rights she was being taught about civil rights and the history of America etc cetera, etc cetera. and I remember thinking this is so odd they just teach this history but nobody asks these kids well how do you feel about that yeah right and it was very clear to me that there's a lot of mixed feelings and my daughter actually wrote um, a paper a letter to her school about the mixed feelings of studying about the um, civil civil rights movement mm -hmm. for instance and mm -hmm. being feeling both ashamed and proud of her country mm -hmm. but nobody does anything with the shame mm -hmm. that kids feel mm -hmm. we're taught American history as if the goal is to simply feel proud of our country mm -hmm. but there's no way that you can read that history or in my case live that history and come out feeling anything yes. but ashamed yes and what do we do with that yes and so yes. then there's then we have weird ways of addressing that there's a lot of guilt we're not clear about how to treat um, people of different groups we don't know how to build laws that mm -hmm. are actually just and fair mm -hmm. for all populations mm -hmm. there's a new book out called um, the new Jim Crow mm -hmm. and it states that there are more african-american men in prison than were ever enslaved mm -hmm. in this country uh -huh. there's something wrong yes yes you know when you yes. see that you know we're not done yes and as you're talking i'm aware of the shadows it makes me just think about shadows you know that it seems as if we um we may be living with um, the shadows of the unacknowledged history you know, right in front of us. Mm -hmm. So it seems as if there's a way in which there may be a, a movement in the American soul toward recreating in the shadows right in front of us what we've not been able to reconcile behind us. Does that fit with what, how you feel this or how you think about it? I think that's really true. I think in some odd way it's a dysfunctional m method of attempting to see and mm -hmm. deal with this history mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and when it does come up what mm -hmm. I notice in white groups is there's so much um, guilt mm -hmm. that the most we can ever do is um, defend ourselves for instance I was at a discussion recently um, about the film traces of the trade yes. stories of the deep north yes where in which a family traces their historical um, background and the recognition the discovery the surprise that they were related to some of the largest slave traders in this country yes and when that film was presented and it was a pretty much an all white audience um, and the discussion afterwards centered around I have a really good friend who's African-American and mm -hmm. I've really defended civil mm -hmm. rights in mm -hmm. this way etc cetera, etc cetera. Mm -hmm. and so when people see that the impetus of white people seeing it is to feel immediately guilty mm -hmm. and to disassociate themselves mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. from the fact that they have had any mm -hmm. part in this mm -hmm. and it's easy to do because mm -hmm. it's in our history books but for me it's not in my history book mm -hmm. you know it's in my experience mm -hmm. and so it's not a matter of so you have to find a real way yeah. to deal with this yeah. as opposed to yeah. distance yeah. myself yes. I need to be able and this is why I find constellation work healing is it offers a way to turn and face this history and to acknowledge it and to honor mm -hmm. that I am a part of those ancestors and a part of this history mm -hmm. that is shameful mm -hmm. and when I can take responsibility for it and recognize that I have benefited for it mm -hmm. and stand in front of it mm -hmm. just acknowledging the reality mm -hmm. I don't have to live through the guilt mm -hmm. which makes me deny reality mm -hmm. and that is very freeing mm -hmm. Mm 
-hmm. not to have to live through the guilt that forces me to deny the reality is very freeing. Mm -hmm. I can't tell you the amount of strength there is in owning even the shameful parts mm -hmm. of my history. Mm -hmm. As you're speaking, um, um, I'm grateful for the um, opportunity to say that what I see all the time in my work is again the the untapped resource of our ancestors. Mm -hmm. So the constellation, you know, method how it gives us an access to our ancestors. Mm. It's not um, the only way for this to happen, but it is quite an accessible way available to us. Um, the strength that comes from this. Um, connection for me is what I see is that it, that's yes. that's where the necessary strength will come from to face the mm -hmm. histories that are difficult to face so it's not only you know facing the shadows of the past but it's realizing that before the shadows there there is this strength from our ancestors available to help us face what's there right. so that we can move into the future with more clarity um, I want to really, as we're talking, remember too that um, what we're living with now in terms of the economy, mm -hmm. you know, what I see and I want to mm -hmm. see, you know, your reflections on this mm -hmm. as well, um, the, the landscape of history in the states behind us around colonialism, around slavery, the economic, the land, um, and human dignity taking economic benefit that has come from this. What I see is that we have as a country unconsciously sold ourselves now to China. China owns the US. So for me what I see is that this is a deep unconscious atonement. Mm. This is a deep mm. movement toward trying to reconcile reconcile the history we've not been able to see so we could continue down that path or not we might not know yet what another path looks like but I wonder quite a lot what it looks like if we consider this if we see this that perhaps this is how we got here perhaps we got here to this place that we're at now where the US has is owned by China, India, other places too, but primarily China. We would rather be owned by another country also across the ocean okay. than face the history of the taking what there was no right to take. I, I check that out with you partly again because of your recent experience growing up first in an uncolonized and then colonized state. Um, if that makes sense to you, how you feel that when I say that? Well, it's interesting. I really hadn't thought of it as a um, way of atoning. I actually had thought of it, so it's. Uh, I have to contemplate that a little mm -hmm. bit. Um, I thought of it as a continuation of the way in which the corporations have become the slave mm -hmm. owners, mm -hmm. um, slave mm -hmm. traders. Um, and that because labor is cheaper someplace else, we've continued mm -hmm. to um, perpetrate slavery in a place that doesn't have um, the laws that defend their, their citizenry in the same way. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of as far as I've gotten, I guess, in my thinking. I haven't really... Um, mm -hmm. I don't know how we play out our guilt. Mm -hmm. I've, I've um, watched it, as I said, in this group where we try to distance ourselves from anything that means that we're not innocent. Mm -hmm. We protect our innocence um, to the death, practically. Yes. Um, yes. Which will enable us to give things away that we haven't really considered what it is we're giving mm -hmm. away. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's the best, that's the link that I make with it, is mm -hmm. that it's, um, it's out of a desperate preservation of innocence. Mm 
yes in a way yes. that we yep move that way yeah i see that too i look forward to more conversations because it is one of those um complex fields but it's a blessing to be able to just have even a little bit of conversation about it